Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Next week is an historic one for Pope Francis. He'll make his first trip to the United States since becoming Pope in March of 2013. He'll visit President Obama in Washington, D.C., stop by a high school in a poor section of New York, and attend a Catholic Families Conference in Philadelphia. Now, since he was elected to the papacy, Francis has made headlines for many things. His decision to live in a simple hostel, his modest Pope mobile, his description of the church as a field hospital after a battle. But that's not to say his time as Pope has been without controversy. His relatively liberal statements on issues such as homosexuality and divorce have caused debates within the Catholic Church, and his call to action on climate change and condemnation of unbridled capitalism and the cult of money put him at odds with political conservatives in the U.S. and elsewhere. Later in the show, we'll talk to three experts who will discuss how Pope Francis is and is not changing the church. But first, a look inside what it's like to actually cover the papacy. Joining us from Rome, Silvia Pujoli, the senior European correspondent for NPR. Thanks so much for joining us. Nice to be with you. You've covered Pope Francis and at least two of his predecessors. You've said Pope Francis is something of an unpredictable person to cover. Tell us just a little bit about that. Well, some of the things you mentioned, I mean, uh, it, was first, it was during his first uh, uh, airborne press conference on his return from Brazil just a few months after he was elected in 2013, when in response to a question, he's uh, talking about uh, homosexual priests, and he said, who am I to judge, which became obviously the signature motto of... Um, of this papacy. He's unpredictable in many things. He he has a very straightforward language, very down to earth, uh, and he is um, he's fearless about, uh, you know, challenging people about uh, certain um, certainties that, that have been in, well, both within people within the church and outside. So um, I think a lot of people, uh, we know what his schedule is. It's going to be a very intense schedule both in Cuba and in the United States. But I would expect that we will also have some surprises during that visit. And in terms of his predecessors, what were they like to cover in comparison with Pope Francis? Do you get the sense that uh, Pope Francis has been more open or welcoming to the press or not so much? Well, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, until John, the papacy of John Paul II, there was absolutely no contact because... These popes didn't travel, and the contact, the, the essential contact that reporters have with the popes are on, on these visits. Um, but it wasn't really until Benedict, who actually started holding sort of very uh, more rigid forms of press conferences, limited press conferences on the plane, it's definitely Francis who's created sort of the freewheeling um, press conference. On, again, on that flight on the return from uh, Rio, he spoke standing for 80 minutes with uh, the and taking questions uh, un. un not necessarily prepared questions uh, ahead of time. So he has created a complete new, not only that, he is the first pope to really give lots of um, interviews. And it has been through many of these interviews that we've gotten uh, an incredible um, insight into who the person is and uh, it, you know, just as, as, a, as a personality. And do you think this accessibility has changed how the media covers him and how the media treats him? Well, um, yeah, I'd say perhaps uh, there's um, there's a lot more enthusiasm uh, covering this beat than there has been in quite a while. Um, I want to ask you, why do you think he's been so influential outside of the walls of the church? You know, the Chinese premier is coming here just after the pope is here, and yet there's just this sort of frenzy of coverage about the pope's visit. Why, why is he such an influential figure, even for people who aren't Catholic? Well, first of all, let's let's say that the Catholic Church was not exactly enjoying uh, the best um, popularity and esteem in the world, given you know a, a decade and more of these of the sex abuse scandals. Certainly, the the prestige of the church was very very low. That's one thing, and uh, and 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 his just it's his person. I mean, following also a a much more reserved pope like Benedict the Sixteenth. Uh, that's, uh, this is, a, he's, this is a very, this is, looks like a man who's very happy, who's enjoying himself and, and his, and his, uh, enthusiasm about the world is very, um, infectious. Uh, people really, you know, uh, are, are admiring him. And, and the other thing is that he has really now emerged as a voice on the global stage, a political voice, I'd say, uh, in, on, uh, on, and, and, and one that's very new. He comes with this perspective of the global south. He's a Latin American. Uh, it's a completely new thing. 
And it has caught the imagination, I'd say, in particular, of many non-believers, not just Catholics. And, of course, estranged Catholics are also very excited about uh, this papacy. Well, you spoke of him almost as a global political figure. He has met some resistance within the church to some of the changes that he's made. How does that play out when you're covering the papacy? How free do people within the church feel to criticize him openly? How much is it sort of a, are there whispers against him in reporters' ears, if you will? Oh, the, Vatican's is, the Vatican is still a place of whispers. It is not yet uh, in any way a, a completely open um, a place for open dialogue. It's, uh, the resistance is there. It's very strong within, within the Curia. Not all of it, but uh, he's made changes. He's made personnel changes, but it takes time. But there's definitely, people will tell you that mostly it's a resistance of, of not doing, not necessarily obstructing him, but of not carrying out many of his directives. And uh, it'll take quite a while before, you know, this changes because it's going to take a tremendous personnel change. And that does not happen quickly. Sylvia Pajoli of NPR, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Joining us now to discuss Pope Francis's recent pronouncement and how he's shaping the future of Catholicism from Rome, Robert Gall, Jr., Associate Professor of Ethics in the School of Philosophy of the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. From Boston, Massachusetts, James Carroll, distinguished writer in residence at New York University and author of Christ Actually, Reimagining Faith in the Modern Age. And from Dayton, Ohio, Dennis Doyle, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton. James Carroll, I wanted to ask you, uh, first off, welcome to the show. Um, you said that radical is a good word to describe this pope. What, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, greetings to you, and uh, thanks for having me. Well, in, in the way, the simplest way to understand what Pope Francis means, uh, I believe, is to understand his message, his uh, personal style, uh, his large heart, his attitude toward people in relationship to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, this pope is reminding us that the church has its ground, its, its, its core, its essential uh, being in the person of Jesus Christ, who was the Prince of Peace, who was the uh, great advocate of the love of neighbor for neighbor, uh, who constantly uh, affirmed uh, the outcast, the marginal, the poor. So what we see at this hope uh, is a return to that very basic truth about what the Christian uh, community is all about. And that's what I mean first by radical. Everything uh, this pope is saying and doing, I believe, uh, points to the core meaning of uh, faith in God. Robert Gall, Jr. in Rome, how about you? What do you make of this pope's leadership style? Do you see things the same way? I feel I feel I agree that agree that he is uh, radical. He's also unpredictable, and he's also a really a personal character mark of his is that he's a totally free man. So I, I entirely agree with uh, James Carroll that he is very conscious of the long tradition of the church. The church is two thousand years old, and that he is representing Jesus Christ, who is a shepherd who is looking for the lost sheep. At the same time, he's unpredictable because he knows that he is bringing a message of reform, which is not just a message, but it's a call also to transform the structures of governance in the church. This has to do with who makes the decisions in the church regarding temporal affairs, like how to express the message, whether it's all centralized in Rome or whether the local bishops are, should be the ones who are more in control. And Pope Francis, in emphasizing synodality, is trying to, should, you could say, devolve some of this, uh, this authority to the local bishop and empower the local bishops to, to also represent Jesus Christ. None of this is entirely new. This has all, always been the case for 2,000 years, but it's a change of style. And I think it's his unpredictability that is one of the reasons why so many in the media are following his papacy with such attention. And Dennis Doyle, 
Pope Francis has been careful not to criticize his two predecessors, but the Pope, he does seem to have the most uh, in common with is Pope John the Twenty Third, who was Pope in the early 1960s. He launched the Vatican II reforms in the Church. Can you just remind our listeners what John the Twenty Third was known for and why Vatican II was sort of so significant to the Catholic Church? Sure. Um, John the Twenty Third was known for calling that council and for um, bringing a new direction to the Catholic Church uh, in the middle of the 20th century and for uh, bringing in a new spirit and uh, uh, a new attitude toward the world. Uh, that The Catholic Church uh, had been at loggerheads with the modern world uh, since, since the French Revolution and uh, had this whole history of, of kind of building a fortress uh, over against the world. And, and Vatican II um, was the church coming out and saying, look, there's, there's a lot, lot of things happening out there in the modern world. It's at least an ambiguous place. Much of it is positive, and we need to be in dialogue with the, with the modern world. We need, we need to look at the signs of the times, and uh, we need to be out there engaging the problems the world faces and working together with other people of goodwill. So the church became much more outward-looking then. Mass no longer had to be in Latin. The priest faced the church. There was greater space for women. There was an acknowledgment that people who weren't Catholic could be granted salvation then. Yeah, and, and so, so relative to a lot of things that had been happening before that, I mean, there had always been like a loophole for, for uh, people who weren't Catholic to be saved, but um, there was a very strong positive statement at the Second Vatican Council, as well as a whole document on our relation with world religions, uh, which, which was very positive. So yeah, all those things. Vatican II brought with it a new direction, and in, in its own time, it was revolutionary. I mean, historically speaking, you have to see both the revolution that took place, but you also have to see it. It's evolution. That's the way these things take, take place. It's, it's complex how, how traditions uh, uh, evolve and so on. But yeah, the basic direction of the Second Vatican Council in its own time was, you know, we're in a new space. And James Carroll, in The New Yorker, you wrote about your experience meeting Pope John the Twenty Third, and use that to sort of compare uh, the two popes here. Can you give us just a greater sense as to why you see some parallels there? Well, to me, the most important thing that uh, Pope John the Twenty Third's Council did was reorder the Church's understanding of itself. It was no longer to be understood as a hierarchy. The Church is not the bishops and the and the Pope and the priests. The Church, as the Council said, is the people of God. And you had that sense from uh, Pope John the Twenty Third that he took the experience of the people quite seriously, and he was he was a man uh, rooted in in the um, trauma of the age, especially uh, I would say the Holocaust. Uh, he experienced the failure of the church during the Holocaust, and I believe that's what drove him in his sense that the church needed to do some serious reckoning and changing, which is what he initiated with the council. And that process has been underway ever since. Uh, the uh, successors to John the Twenty Third have carried it forward, even if with ambivalence and, and some struggle. And I think that Pope Francis is, um, in a way, the return to the forefront of the insights of John the Twenty Third, And in a way, he's bringing the uh, courageous, well, yes, revolution is uh, Professor Doyle's word, the courageous revolution of the church uh, to the next stage. Robert Gall, Jr., a number of media outlets have said that the Pope has changed his views and his approach since he was the provincial superior of the Jesuits back in Argentina, back before he became Pope, um, that he's changed from being sort of more of an authoritarian uh, type leader to a more open and welcoming one. What What's your take on this? Well, Pope Francis himself has spoken of this transition, his learning experience in his own life as a man of church governance, that when he was a provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina, he tended to just command and tell people what they had to do with a top-down kind of uh, understanding of authority. And he said that he's since come to realize that there's a need for a greater dialogue, a greater collegiality, what he calls today synodality which comes from the term synod, which is like walking together on the path together. Uh, and he refers especially to the bishops around the world. So when he makes decisions 
as Pope today, he wants to do so along with the bishops all around the world. This is a reason why in October here in Rome, there's going to be another synod on the family, which with uh, bishops from around the world and other representatives of the church, also lay people and lay couples. And it'll be very interesting to see the interaction between the German bishops and the African bishops and Pope Francis trying to keep them united at the same time that they're in continuity with the faith that the church has received from Jesus, from the apostles, and was developed by John Paul II and Pope Benedict, just for instance. And Dennis Doyle, on this issue of decentralization of the church, we have seen a number of uh, Protestant faiths essentially divide along geographic lines over some hot button issues, particularly over the issue of homosexuality. Is that a risk for the Catholic Church as Francis tries to decentralize well, some of the control structures? Well, there's always that risk of, of schism, uh, but um, that risk goes either way, that these are hot button issues that face the people of this world right now, and people are dividing over them, and uh, no matter what uh, religious tradition they're in or, or non-religious people are dividing over these issues, um, the Catholic thing historically has been to say that unity is more important than our own partisan positions on things. And I think that um, history has shown that the great direction of the Catholic Church has been to try to find positions that are sensitive to a wide range of concerns and that, that those who belong to the Catholic Church uh, are really interested in unity first. And, and yes, schism is, all, is always a danger, and some people have left the church in, in the last few decades o over issues. But great numbers of people have left, not as many as have stayed now, but, uh, but, but he, 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 has to, he has to lead us uh, in a direction that will be sensitive to, to what these challenges are really making us face, and, and what, what the sciences tell us, what the social sciences tell us, and what... Um, what the need for a greater sense of, of personalism in this world tells us. He, he's got to be true to that. And um, I, I think people will follow someone whom they experience as authentic. And, and, and that's certainly my discernment about Pope Francis. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week, I look into Pope Francis's policies and his appeal as he prepares for his first trip to the United States. Joining us this week from Rome, Robert Gall, Jr., Associate Professor of Ethics in the School of Philosophy of the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. From Boston, Massachusetts, James Carroll, Distinguished Writer-in-Residence at New York University and author of Christ Actually, Reimagining Faith in the Modern Age. And from Dayton, Ohio, Dennis Doyle, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton. James Carroll, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, argued on NBC's Meet the Press that Francis's style alters nothing of sort of the substance uh, of the church's positions on issues like uh, homosexuality, on uh, divorce, on some of these other hot button issues, abortion. What, what do you make of this argument? With due respect to uh, Cardinal Do uh, Dolan, um, style is substance, I would say. Uh, Jason, and I, I think that's in a way the most important thing to have in mind with Pope Francis. When he is respectful and compassionate toward people who are gay or to, toward women who have had abortions or toward um, people who have been outcasts in any number of ways, uh, the substance of uh, the principles of rejection uh, that have put such people on the margins of the church or of culture is radically being altered. It may be uh, a gradual process, but when the Pope himself issues judgmentalism in relationship to gay people, uh, you can bet that in some basic way, the church's attitude toward gay people is undergoing change. Similarly with divorced and remarried Catholics, uh, similarly, I would say, with the place of women in the church, there is a process of change underway and in strong but subtle ways. Well, because his predecessor, Pope Benedict, had referred to homosexuality as an intrinsic evil. I mean, is that something, is that still the church's position in spite of what Pope Francis has said? Well, the church's position, quote-unquote, is, uh, is fluid. Uh, 
I, I don't think there is any uh, leader of the church today who would return to the language, the extreme and judgmental language that you're referring to there. Um, I think that uh, Pope Francis has basically invited a change in rhetoric, a change in, yes, style, uh, a change, as he puts it, in attitude. When God looks at a gay person, what does God see? That's the question he asked. And God sees one of God's beloved creatures. That's the first thing to be said. All of us, all of us fall short of the call that we've been given as human beings and as Christians. Uh, and every person needs to be seen in the light of a kind of compassionate spirit of acceptance and forgiveness, even while we're all constantly held to a higher standard. We all have to live up to uh, higher standards. Pope Francis is just basically, as I said before, returning us to the ground of our faith, which is uh, Jesus Christ, for whom every person was to be received with love and respect. Robert Dahl, Jr., I'll let you take a swing at that as well. Have some of these statements, have they been overhyped in the media, or is his change in style effectively a change in substance? Well, this is a fascinating issue, that of style and substance and the relationship between the two. It, it, is, it is the case that every time that the Pope speaks, there is a kind of adjustment of the substance. But by adjustment, the way the Church considers this, and there's a great deal of development in theology, is that this is not the change of a teaching, meaning that the, our faith doesn't change, the faith that we receive from God is the same, but that God is so great, God is infinite, that we can always progress in our understanding of the truths that he's communicated to us. So when both um, John Paul II and uh, Benedict XVI very much uh, tried to stress through very carefully articulated teachings that God is love, that God is mercy, and that we are called, that we are all called to love, and that the, the church and the faith is much more than prohibitions. But what's amazing is that Francis has succeeded in getting that message across in a very powerful way by emphasizing that God is tender and that he caresses us and that he seeks out the sinner, which is, of course, what Jesus, what Jesus uh, did, did and what he explained with the image of the good shepherd looking for the lost sheep. But this does not mean in any way that Francis has changed church teaching. Lying is still uh, condemned by the church, as is adultery and fornication and theft and murder. Dennis Doyle, Francis has talked about the church today as a field hospital in the middle of a battle, that you don't sort of go about treating people's high cholesterol or how much they exercise when they're bleeding from a wound. What, I mean, what does that metaphor tell us about how he's addressing some of these issues in the church today? Well, he's, he's ba basically... Uh, paraphrasing St. Augustine when, when he says that, but uh, he, he's stressing this theme of mercy. And uh, a lot of what he's doing is he's, um, we see a shift in the priorities. If, uh, say, the U.S. bishops uh, before were saying, okay, well, um, uh, homosexuality, it's, um, the behavior is wrong, but the orientation uh, people just can't help that. Uh, he, he's, he's shifting the, ori the, the order of priorities to say, look, we embrace every human being as human beings in all of their aspects. And, uh, and, and so this, this idea of mercy and, and inclusion, radical inclusion, I think uh, it's not hard to read the Gospels and see Jesus as a radical includer and, and as, as a prophet. And, and Francis is, is prophetic. His, his bottom line is joy. It's the joy of the gospel. But the people who know the joy of the gospel, sometimes they're going to get angry because Francis is explaining to us things that we should be angry about. And we should be angry about excluding people. And we should be angry about destroying the environment. And, uh, I mean, there are certain things that, that he's not changing. Certain kind of changes take more than one papacy. He's not going to turn around and, and contradict something that his most two recent predecessors have said, but he's going to become silent on certain aspects of those things, and in one or two more papacies, maybe there would be room for change. Uh, you know, change in the church, uh, it takes a long time. Well, let me turn it to James Carroll. There are two issues in particular that have gotten the church a lot of negative press over the last 10 or 15 years. One is its opposition to birth control, particularly condoms uh, in the face of the AIDS epidemic. 
in Africa. And then the second issue, of course, is the child sexual abuse scandal, which has really metastasized to be kind of a global scandal. Tell us just a little bit about how you see the Pope, how that he has addressed these issues already and what, what more he might do. Well, you know, it, it goes back to the point of Vatican II that redefined the church as the people of God. So on the question of birth control, the church has already changed its stance on birth control. That's true, not because of the bishops or the pope, but because of the Catholic people who in Europe, uh, in the United States, and even in uh, large parts of the developing world have simply made their own choice on this matter of birth control. They are not waiting for approval from bishops who disapprove them. The uh, position of the hierarchy on birth control, frankly, is scandalous. And we saw that, especially in the AIDS epidemic, as you uh, remind us. The condemnation of the use of condoms by bishops, especially in Africa, during the height of the AIDS epidemic, and it goes on, has cost many, many people their lives. And that's wrong. Uh, Pope... Uh, Francis has not directly addressed the question of birth control, but he has affirmed the uh, value of Catholic conscience, and it's in the Catholic conscience that this change has taken place. On sex abuse, of course, the, 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 the scandal that a relatively small number of priests abuse children, while almost the entire a collection of Catholic bishops protected the abusers instead of the children was the ultimate collapse of the moral authority of the teaching uh, function of the church. And once again, it was the Catholic people who affirmed the values of Christianity and uh, Catholic faith uh, in, the, in the light of this uh, terrible crisis. And the Catholic people have been the ones to insist upon institutional and structural change that's underway. Um, change is happening in the church. When I was born as a Catholic Christian, I was taught that there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. That was a doctrine. It was affirmed by St. Thomas Aquinas and by popes going back a thousand years, by church councils. That no salvation outside the church is gone. It's history. It was overturned. So in it sounds like you're decades. optimistic that there will be sort of continuing change, evolution here in the coming years. It is part of life, and it is part of the life of the church. The church pretends otherwise, and we should stop doing that. So we can, as the church recognizes the truths of experience, for example, that gender equality is a matter of justice and it's a matter of the future of the human species. Therefore, the church will move toward gender equality, including the full admission of women to the positions of power in the church. James Carroll, so we're just about out of time. We're going to have to leave it there for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Sylvia Pujoli, Robert Gall Jr., James Carroll, and Dennis Doyle for coming on the program. Global Journalist Executive Producer is Josh Kranzberg. Our associate producers this week are Lakshna Mehta, Nicole Osuna, Adam Sturrock, Colby Satterfield, and Vera Tan. Our studio director is Travis McMillan from RJI. Our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us.